I've been in debt, like I said, 350K uh, personally, right? Which is like so crushing. And then to feel like I hit this seven figure number for the first time in my life. And it's, it's a number that is real was amazing to me. I, I went for a run once I, once I saw that. And I remember like singing as I was running and I had the most energy that I'd almost ever had. And I felt so good, this, this feeling of accomplishment. Welcome to today's episode of Invested Success. I'm really excited to present our guest today to you who has made up to $9 million in cryptocurrency investments. That's right, this is a innovator, early adopter, and thought leader in the cryptocurrency space, and his name is George Burke. George is also a serial founder of multiple startups, three of which he's exited, but he will also be the first to brag about and admit his many, many failures that it took him to get to this success today. It's really fun having this conversation. We discuss what it was like buying Ethereum for 30 cents, why he moved to Puerto Rico to join the cryptocurrency revolution, what's the future of Bitcoin, and so much more. If you've ever thought about dabbling in cryptocurrency, or even if you you're a total cryptocurrency devotee, this episode is something you're going to want to watch if you want to know what the future of wealth, money, and currency is going to be. Before we get started, please remember to smash that like button and click subscribe wherever you happen to be listening. If you like me to bring early adopters and innovators and thought leaders who are successful that you can learn from, remember to smash that like button and comment below to tell me what you think of the show. As always, thanks for tuning in. And without further ado, please help me welcome George Burke, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin expert. Welcome, George. Hey, I'm so excited to have you. Oh, thank you. A big fan question that we get a lot is a lot of like Bitcoin stuff. Everyone wants to know how it works and how to get into it and and if they should. And you and I have a great history of Bitcoin together because we were at like the Bitcoin conference in San Francisco, but that was before we knew each other. We only realized later that we were at the same conference. Yeah. Those were the early days of Bitcoin. Price was probably less than a thousand dollars at that point. I could look at a room and recognize like half the people in there as people I, I know. And uh, I was recently in New York at a conference called Mainnet, and I barely recognized anyone in there. And I think a lot of the people who were in New York at the time for the conference weren't actually at the conference, but just kind of hanging out at after parties. What have you been looking into uh, for, for Bitcoin recently? Have you been seeing any news or anything that you wanted to hit specifically? As advanced as we are in Bitcoin, there's like still, and I'm not going to pretend I'm advanced, as advanced as you are at Bitcoin, there's still just a lot of stuff that people don't know about the basics and what they should know. And I'm always interested in like your unique angle. And I'd love to just start at the beginning with you. Like, when was the first time that you got into Bitcoin? What sparked that interest for you? It's a really uh, interesting question. I, I have a friend and former co-founder of my company, BookSwim. We were in New Jersey shipping books through the mail the way that Netflix was delivering DVDs. It was a book subscription model. And uh, that was an interesting company for, for us. My co-founder and I kind of fell apart, but got back into touch when in 2012, he was trying to tell me about this really cool technology that I didn't care about at all. And I didn't understand what he was trying to put together. I didn't understand what the reason for this decentralized asset was, this this digital cash. It didn't, it didn't matter at the time. I, I didn't really get it. The price more so than the philosophy is what drew me in. In 2013, as my friend Shimon, um, his name, was continuing to mine Bitcoin on his computers and and his desktops at at the office and using like the free electricity to do so. He was making some decent money and and, like Bitcoin was like $12 at the time. So he was excited about it and wanted, wanted to get me into it. I wasn't really all that receptive until I saw the price hit 35 and then I'm like, 
well, this actually makes sense. I think I should pull the trigger on getting some of this. And, and I asked what to do. So I had, at that time, the business was struggling. There was probably, let's say about $10,000 of credit that I personally had remaining. I was very over leveraged. I, I owed like $350,000 because I, I had personally guaranteed all these loans on the business. And it was, it was pretty rough, but I was like, I, with this, you know, uncensorable technology and the pseudonymous nature of the way the technology works, I, I figured, okay, if I have to go through bankruptcy, maybe there's this tiny nest egg of like 10 K maybe it grows, but this tiny nest egg of like 10 K I, I can like reach into that. Nobody really knows about that. I can help get back on my feet with. What was interesting is when I, when I tried to put my money in at 35, I didn't put in 10K, by the way, I, I put in like 5,000 because I also spent another 5,000 on mining equipment, not to mine Bitcoin, but to mine Litecoin. And at the time it was like 10 cents. So I didn't really believe much in Litecoin. It's not that it really mattered, but I knew that I could trade Litecoin for Bitcoin. And it was a lot easier based on the mining difficulty to mine Litecoin than it was to mine Bitcoin. So I'm like, all right, let me, let me get this mining equipment, mine Litecoin, I'll sell it for Bitcoin, yada, yada, yada. When I pulled the trigger on sending $5,000 into an exchange, it was through Mt. Gox. The price had risen between 35 to 70. And now I was only able to buy my first coins at, uh, at 70. But what's fascinating is over time, the price kept going up. This is 2013. We saw a banking crisis in Cyprus. The Cypriot government wanted to tap into each citizen's bank account where there was over something like $100,000 or 100,000 euros in, in, in there to take 25% of it for themselves. And that was like October, 2013, when we saw Bitcoin go from like hundred dollars to $400. And then quickly after 1200 is where it peaked uh, during that year. And so that year was fascinating for me. I kind of stopped being interested in, in books and got really interested in this technology because of what it could provide, right? Safety from overreach of the state. And I finally started to really understand the political standpoint and the societal understanding of what, it, what occurs with Bitcoin and individuals' rights and the ability to, to, I think, keep the state at bay from stopping going overboard and printing money and bankrupting people from essentially the, the, the inside out with that hidden tax of inflation. So all of these things I thought would be something that would make Bitcoin make sense. So I was able to sell or exit my, my company BookSwim. I didn't make anything off of that. And I still had this debt. I sold it for, for less than what the debt was, but Bitcoin went up so much that I was able to pay back my debt years later because of how much Bitcoin had, had gone up in price. So it started out for me as this thing that I was sneakily hiding, hoping that maybe like $10,000 would, you know, save me as a small nest egg, you know, from being homeless to actually being something of a, of a wealth builder for myself, where I was able to pay off those debts free and clear. So Cool, right? That's that. That's kind of the story of how I got into it. I had no idea. See, this is why I love the podcast because I can learn all of these cool things about you that we never talked about. So, what brought you to that day, that Bitcoin conference? Was this about that time where you were able to pay off your debts, or like what was the story leading up to that conference for you? Yeah, maybe I was running a company called Fresh Pay, and I started that with a guy named Brandon Goldman in 2013, late 2013, to become the first Bitcoin debit card in the United States. It was this uh, elusive holy grail to be able to consider whether Bitcoin was going to be spendable digital cash. Well, how would that even be possible? We'd have to somehow marry it with the traditional finance world. How could we do that for consumers? How can Bitcoin actually take off and be like a world currency? Well, it needs to be spent everywhere that Visa and MasterCard is accepted. So 
that's what we set out to do. And it took a few years, but we were able to get the first banking contract in the US to issue a Bitcoin debit card. Well, what it was technically is a reloadable prepaid card loaded with the sale of digital assets. <laughs> uh, so that was technically the name, the name for it. You could for short call it a Bitcoin debit card. Unfortunately, we couldn't actually launch. It was, it, we, ran out of money in 2016 the market was down bitcoin was like maybe a few hundred bucks at its bottom and some of our investment was in btc which meant that without diversifying back to us dollars it was going to it was going to dwindle right from the inside so although we were unable to sustain the company what's kind of cool is bitpay and coinbase are leveraging the same contract that we were able to forge back in 2015 with uh, this one bank called Metro Bank. I don't know whether they're still using that same bank uh, for their debit cards. I don't even think people are using debit cards, but really what killed it is the IRS. The IRS basically said that if you're ever spending a Bitcoin, even to buy coffee, you have to log what your cost basis is for that and then pay the capital gains tax, if there is any, or at least log it, right? So you you, you get a Bitcoin for, what is it today? $55,000 is what, what, what we saw at peak at. And if you went to go buy a coffee for $4, $5, you would then have to log when you bought that Bitcoin and just, what was what $5 over $55,000, right? The, the, the fraction of that makes absolutely no sense to need to log, but you, you do. So the IRS, I think, pretty much killed the ability for Bitcoin to ever be a spendable currency, at least within the United States. They treat it like a property. They treat it like a stock or a house. Actually, let's, let's, call, it, uh, let's call it a house, right? A, a, a property, because if it was a stock, the it's a completely different thing. It would then be governed by the SEC, which it's not. Yeah. So the reason why we were in that uh, conference in SF in 2015 or 2014, when you and I were getting into the space, was probably trying to get investors. And that's kind of the, the hustle that we were doing all throughout uh, 2013 to 2015. And being somewhat successful in 2013 and very unsuccessful the years later. I find that really interesting. And I remember that day because I had done marketing for that conference and it was a lot of work and it was really hard to get reg. Things were like, I remember Bitcoin crashed that day and everybody was very sad at that conference. In my life, I, I think you've probably felt this pang as well of being like an early adopter yeah. where you're like too ahead of it actually. And yeah. like you're out of it by the time everyone else is into it. I have a funny story about that. So Jackson, who invented Dogecoin, has kind of rage quit Bitcoin uh, and the, the crypto space entirely more than once, which, it, which is pretty funny. And he would say that he had sold all of his Doge or gave it away or who knows what he, what he did with it. But randomly, I was getting a haircut and the barber, he's from Korea. He doesn't speak much English, but he said that he loved investing in, uh, in in crypto. He was talking about how Doge had blown up over the uh, over the last year and he can't imagine what it would be like to be the founder of Dogecoin. Like he says, can you imagine this guy who invented it? I think I've seen a picture of him. Like he must be wealthy beyond be, beyond his wildest dreams. And I'm like just the opposite. He still has his day job at Adobe. He loves it there. And he doesn't really care much about the crypto space. He hasn't, he hasn't held like Doge for maybe several years. I, I don't know. The whole space basically went, you know, went on its own without him. And that's, and that's Jackson's choice. It's the way he wanted it. But I don't see him as being someone who got rich off of Doge only uh, if he is wealthy, rich off of the fact that he made Doge, <laughs> the personality that he is. Great guy. I haven't seen him in a long time either. But then again, I haven't seen several people in a long time. We've had a pandemic. I moved to Puerto Rico. Oh, that is a great story. I had no idea. What does rage quitting Bitcoin look like? You just sell it all and give everyone the middle finger and peace out. Is that how that uh, public, out? Publicly, publicly telling people that you don't like what's going on 
and you make a claim that you've sold all of your assets. That makes sense. I mean, I could see it like the, I've seen the Bitcoin space go through a lot of phases. It's painful to be an early adopter. So my favorite Bitcoin stories, I mm. had one distant acquaintance who I only learned many years later. I had no idea this was going on at the time that they were running like when the Silk Road was going on, they were running a drug operation, which really blew my mind because I knew them at the time and they were super just straight laced and quiet and seemed like they they wouldn't be running a dark web uh, drug operation. And of course I didn't know at the time, they only told me years later when it was like officially over. Very Breaking Bad, but with like a happy ending and much less murder probably. But they looked back and told me they were, all of their transactions were going in Bitcoin at that time. And if they had just not done any illegal drug sales and just kept all the Bitcoin that they had, they would be like much wealthier beyond belief. And I think- mm -hmm you know, they made like, I don't know, $50,000 from it. And I think they'd be like multimillionaires out of the Bitcoin if they just kept it. So kept the transaction, but didn't deliver the drugs. Yeah. They just like kept the original cryptocurrency. So if they, and, if they and screwed hate. over the people who trusted them to send them drugs in the mail, then, <laughs> then they would be extremely rich and decided to keep it. Okay. I understand. I think, no, I think it's more <laughs> like the amount that they invested in the crypto to make, start the whole operation going. If they just uh -huh. not done anything and just put it in the crypto, then, yep. and it's like one of their regrets to this day. So the moral of that story is don't sell drugs and invest in crypto, I guess. But I'm sure you've heard a lot of those stories too. Regretful spend expenditures. I've even had plenty of them. I invested, and I don't even know if I can call the word invested. I, I pre-bought a few Litecoin ASIC miners before they were even invented, uh, essentially uh, putting down like a, uh, a pre-sale of like $12,000 that at the time was probably 20, 30 Bitcoin, depending on when it was that I bought it. The company went under, they never delivered anything. And so there's 20 or 30 Bitcoin that's just spent. Another thing that I actually don't like talking about, for some reason it continues to come up and I'll, I, I might as well just say it. I had also been in the Ethereum crowd sale back in 2014, I think it was, or 2015. Ethereum was selling at 30 cents. What is it today? $3,500, maybe maybe even more, 3,700. I haven't looked, but I was in 2015 selling about 1,500 Ethereums, Ethers at under $3 in order to make rent. So instead of going out to get a real job, I was like, oh, I've got this, this Ether. I, you know what? If it would have taken off by now if it were worth something. If if the team was capable, maybe Vitalik bit off more than he can chew when he invented this and released it. I don't know why people aren't really using it, yada, yada, yada. So I just continued to sell that in order to make rent. I didn't like that I was doing it. The reason I don't like to bring up that story, it kind of, I, I don't think that I need to continue to tell the story of regret. Although it always happens when we're talking of early Bitcoin days, like, oh, what did you spend you know, way overspend your Bitcoin. Did you spend five Bitcoin on, on a coffee? All right, like that type of nonsense. Everybody in the space has those types of regrets. I think that the reason why I don't like bringing it up is because, well, it shows uh, some bit of defeat because it was like I was forced to sell it in order to make rent rather than celebrate it and spend it because I wanted to. That's super compelling and interesting. And I agree. That's a topic I really enjoy diving into. The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel is a book that came out uh, that Teresa and Andy actually recommended to me. And I think the fear greed cycle with currency is really problematic. Mm -hmm. I think you should never have regrets and hold that stuff against yourself because that was the value at the time and nobody can predict the future. And yeah. sure, Bitcoin happened to take off, but like it could have been, it could have gone so many different directions. And like you can only do what you can do with the information you have right now today. So I think that that's really critical. Uh, and I would say don't have regret. I think it's really cool that you share that because we all have those like 
stories, but just the fact that you were smart enough to even have cryptocurrency at all, that's pretty cool in the first place. And I, I should not have regrets, by the way. What I what I think I mean is to not relive them. Well, I just don't think you should beat yourself up at all. I think it's like it's a funny story. Uh, how could anyone know. have known, right? And and there's <laughs> always another train that you can catch. So there's been times there I've is. kicked myself that I didn't get on XYZ train, but then there was another train. Yeah, there 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 is. I mean, look, I'm an entrepreneur for a reason, right? Trying to not get on a train, I'm trying to build the track and build the train got my own train and everyone else can jump jump on it if they want i love that i would definitely classify you as a serial entrepreneur how many businesses have you started what's the difference between a business and a company mm. because there's many businesses but not that many companies let's see book swim that was my first startup i would say but before that i had an llc where i was doing website design a la carte, essentially. And that was during college, right? So that's a, that's a company there. But when pivoting, let's say, to find product market fit, you might have the same company, but different businesses. And the more that you pivot, the, the more kind of unrecognizable that business be, or the original business becomes but it's, it may still be one entity. So like in 2017, I set out to start doing something in the crypto space with my uh, co-founders at the time, Manoj and Chandra. And we were looking at doing something in the medical field and we were looking at biotech. Biotech crowdfunding on the blockchain. That was a way to fractionate potential ownership in these moonshot projects that the public would want to fund that maybe you know the big pharma doesn't want to see uh, succeed but the crowd does and so there may be a way to crowdfund those projects having the the crowd be the owner of the coins that are given to them as a result of of investing those coins represent unit usage licenses that if there is some success to the clinical studies that are being done and a company wants to go to go to market or the company that did the crowdfunding is about to get acquired uh, for their technology they also need to have the unit usage licenses get acquired as well. So that would require the pharmaceutical company to buy back those unit usage licenses at a pre-agreed upon multiple. So that was one way to you know, make a return for those crowd investors. But it's not something that resonated with the crypto community. We didn't really raise anything in 2017, even though all the, these ICOs were going gangbusters during the time and raising a lot to put out a coin. So we pivoted into a completely different business. It was health insurance and you know, basically utilizing the risk sharing pro, uh, component of peer-to-peer insurance while putting it on something that's immutable like blockchain and making the ability for this to occur was something that we wanted to see happen but once again also didn't really resonate with the crypto community and so pivoted again and we pivoted to something that's pure crypto and that's actually what we're doing now at portal which uh, we started out building a wallet that's multi-currency allowing you to trade on uh, various exchanges that are centralized exchanges uh, and decentralized or pseudo decentralized exchanges using your own trading API keys. So you can do this right from within the wallet. And that was 2019 that we pivoted to that still kind of just, you know, coasting by on our own funds from 2017 and 2018 and just hoping that that we can raise some money and we still couldn't. That back then we started thinking about what if instead of us being this, like just this multi-currency wallet, what if we could be an exchange ourselves or facilitate the ability for decentralized exchange to happen by creating a, an open source protocol and allow for coins that are on different chains that are not interoperable to be able to be traded with one another without a choke point of like these exchanges are today, where they can be sanctioned by any government. The founder could be shot or you know killed, and 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 the funds just be taken away from them, and the assets seized by by governments or by hackers. Those things are are honeypots that I see. 
that, that are occurring. And so truly decentralized cross-chain swapping is what we set out to build. And that finally got some traction. So this year we raised money in the last few months. It's been about 10 million that we've been able to put together. And uh, we're about to do our public sale for Portal in two or three weeks. And we're looking at a fundraise of between 20 and 30 million. Really depends on what the market can bear at that point. And this is, this is pretty awesome, right? Uh, I feel very vindicated because what we had set out to do uh, although it may not have been the exact story, was ignored largely, right? Uh, in 2018 uh, or 2019, when we started talking about this cross-chain exchange built on top of Bitcoin, people were like, why the hell are you building on top of Bitcoin? That doesn't make any sense. You've got Ethereum, you've got these other DEXs, and DEXs are, people aren't even using DEX. DEX is a decentralized exchange, right? Uh, people aren't using DEXs. Why do you want to do this? Nobody cares. The story has greatly changed. We're seeing in the DeFi space, DEXs being the primary use of people being able to get in and out of positions. You don't need any permission to have coins that get traded uh, for other coins on, on a DEX. You don't need the permission to earn a yield by you know lending out your coins. Uh, when other people want to borrow them through these automated market maker models or AMM models. There's a huge market for this, but we're seeing the limitations of doing these cross-chain swaps on something like Ethereum because only uh, Ethereum coins can be traded and you'd have to wrap a token from another chain chain. Let's say Bitcoin, you want to trade Bitcoin for Ethereum, you'd have to wrap that Bitcoin into an Ethereum token and have it sitting either with a custodian or locked up in some smart contract that forever is, is kind of also a honeypot for hackers or for someone to lose the damn keys and, and never be able to retrieve what's inside of it. So in order for DeFi to exist in the most trustless way that any of us can think of that's fathomable is to do it through what's called cross-chain atomic swaps. That's what we're building. We're building it on Bitcoin. And people are now realizing that Bitcoin is not going away. It is like the beacon of decentralization. You can't sanction anyone for having built Bitcoin. We can't find the, the founder, obviously. The biggest threat model to Bitcoin are nation states who have the ability to print money endlessly. And in doing so, they can purchase mining equipment, they could buy up mining operations entirely, or they could just take them over using their guns and their tanks and weapons. And so why would they want to take over these mines? Why would, they, why would someone like the US government even want to mine in the first place? Well, it's not because they're trying to gain Bitcoin. It's because the consensus model, what makes the blockchain and, and ledger, this, this this ledger technology so strong is the distributed nature of the miners who are able to come up with consensus as to whether a transaction is valid or not. And if there's ever a discrepancy, the miners rely on what 51% of the other miners think is the valid chain and goes with that. So if you own more than 51% of the hash power on the network, you have the ability to inject false transactions. You have the ability to drop other transactions and you have the ability to reorg the chain to, to, to your will. And that loses trust. That loses public trust in Bitcoin as a store of value, which we see it today as a store of value. I was telling you earlier that the IRS neutered it as a, as a method of exchange. So I'm seeing it more as a store of value, a digital gold. And as it threatens other types of industries, threatens the people in power who want to continue to print uh, money endlessly, they may want to destroy Bitcoin. So what can Portal do to help stop that? Well, perhaps we can increase the political cost of, attack, of wanting to attack Bitcoin. And the way that we can do that is through building many layers on top of Bitcoin that allow for entire economies 
to flow through Bitcoin's pipes. There becomes then a political cost to wanting to attack this when there's so much at stake, potentially when trillions of dollars of smart contracts are built on this, you know, new industries are created and old industries migrate onto something like Bitcoin or actually Bitcoin itself because of the technology that we're building, then you have a method to protect Bitcoin from the powers that be. That's so brilliant. That brings me also like Puerto Rico, how is living there? Why did you move there? And I hear there's like a whole Bitcoin revolution happening over there. Is that true? I see so many friends who are in the space moving. Some who aren't even related to crypto moving here. The Act 60 tax benefits have been a major driver to bring people here. So, you know, come for the taxes and stay for the paradise. I think that that's kind of the way that it is. It's a wonderful place to be. Like I go outside and as long as you can get over sweating 24 seven, you know, the, the, it's beautiful. Just the other day, I walked into the, uh, the ocean because I live right on the beach, which is really cool. The temperature of the air and the temperature of the water somehow were combined in such a way where I put my toe in and I couldn't tell whether my toe was in the water or not. Like the way the feeling was, was just this is sort of like one of those deprivation tanks, right? Where the, the temperature is supposed to be like this perfect temperature where, where you can't tell where the air begins and the, the water ends. That was kind of what it was like. So I get a chance to go snorkeling and swimming like almost every morning with these fish. And it's kind of a cool experience. It's a world that allows me to be very meditative and, and you know, observing of this whole civilization of fish that don't know anything about the, the, the outside world. They don't know anything about land. And it's funny to watch them in their little cities interacting with one another. And I go, it, it's, a, it's a big reminder that like as a human being, like that's not my domain. That's not where we belong, but I, if, I feel really lucky that I get to be immersed in it. It's not, you know, it's nice to watch that kind of keeps me forgetting that I'm uh, huffing and puffing and, and working out while I'm trying to swim laps in the, in the ocean. So it's nice to have a look at that. You know, I'm from New Jersey and the East Coast water during the summer is warm, but it's very dark. You, you can't really see what else is like swimming around you in there. So it also has me thinking, wow, are there like this many fish or even anything close to it swimming around where I grew up, where I'd be in the ocean every weekend in the summer and never really encountered any other living thing other than like when I would see a, a crab walk out of the water or like a horseshoe crab that's, that, that's kind of beached itself or all the jellyfish. Like those are the only creatures that I could ever see in the water. So when you think about what surrounds you, it's, it's a bit magical. Oh, that's one of the most beautiful descriptions I've ever heard. I think that's one of my favorite things I've ever heard on this podcast. I can't wait to see no, that. Apparently there is nowhere else in the world that a U.S. citizen can go and not pay federal taxes. You have to pay your federal taxes unless you've been accepted into the program in, in uh, Puerto Rico. There's that. Let me make a recommendation to you. If you do have designs on moving here, one of the things is there's a three-year program and a one-year program. If you want to take the tax benefit of the year that you move and you're required to be here 183 days per year or 500 70 something days over the course of three years, you basically, if you want to take the year of your move and apply your tax benefit to that, then you're required to be here for three years. But if you do not actually take the tax benefit, the year of your move and you apply it to the next year, then you only need to be here that next year, plus the short amount of time that you might've moved. And what does moving mean? Moving means having rented a place and being able to show that you're continuing to make payments on a, on a lease that you have. And I don't mean that you're, I don't mean your name. What you need to do, for instance, in November, you could, if, if this is something that's affordable to you, is find an apartment that is suitable for uh, you and your husband, rent it and continue to rent it because that can be considered the year of your move. And then next year, 
whether you actually follow through with it or not, you've bought yourself the optionality of only being here for one year and receiving the tax benefit for next year. Yeah. Very clever. I love that. So smart. So optimizing. How did you propose? I know we texted back and forth. The engagement occurred on Maui. And uh, the way that it got started was when I established residency in Puerto Rico, it's because I was able to rent a bedroom from a friend of mine, Micah. He and his fiance got engaged on Maui. They said that's their favorite place on earth. And so the same thing with my fiance, Shoshana, it's her favorite place on earth. And he was like, when are you guys going to get engaged? Like, are you going to pull the trigger? Like, he asks me all the time. It, it's, it's sort of like those couples who are at one stage of life and they're trying to push you into their stage of life, right? So like you got, you got couples with kids and they're like, when are you going to spit out your first baby? It sort of felt like that. But at the same time, I did feel like it was time. It made, it made a lot of sense. So he's like, what you need to do is make sure you have a photographer ready. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, because... Although we got engaged like on a beautiful isolated beach in Maui, there wasn't anyone around. So who was going to take photos? But oddly, apparently there was one passerby and she snapped a photo and serendipitously saw them at a restaurant later on that night and said, you guys were the ones who just got engaged, right? I have a photo of you. And so they were able to send the photo to, to them. So long story short, he said, get a photographer. So now, because Maui is very different from other places in the United States, nobody cares about what you dress like. And I love that. I love that about the, 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 the environment. But it means that we dress like <laughs> on a daily basis. I've got, I would wear what I'm wearing right now <laughs> on a daily basis. It doesn't matter whether we're going out to the fanciest restaurant on the island. Nobody cares. And I love that. So how do I get Shoshana to not wear her yoga pants and a sports bra? And how do I dress up a little fancier than I normally would without, without giving away that something odd is going on? So lucky for me, there, there was this advertisement on Facebook for the Maui flying dress. And what that is, is a, a photo shoot opportunity where they provide you with a dress with a really long train, like 15 feet long. And as the wind is blowing, they would throw the train up in the air and the train would just like fly in the wind. So you have these dramatic photos of all of this material, like behind the person wearing the dress, right? And it's a, it's a gorgeous thing. So I bought this for Shoshana. I said, Hey, look, it's our last week in Maui before we move. Why don't you like do this thing? And she's like, well, that's weird, but like, it's cool. Okay. I, I'm into it. Let's do it. And I was hoping that she didn't think that anything was up, but she, she sort of did. It came to fruition when, uh, during the photo shoot, the photographer says, all right, now, George, you're going to, you're, you're going to get down on your knees. So that way she can walk over to you. Like he's directing the two of us to be in the shot together. Right. And then that's when the engagement occurs. It was pretty cool because we had other people who were on the beach walking by and like they, they cheered us on and I'm sure they'd never seen a spectacle like this, this like modeling photo shoot. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, and then an engagement that occurs. So it was kind of a spectacle. And I loved it. It was Shoshana loved it. And apparently everyone on Facebook who sees her photos, they thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I scored there. I may not score much, but I scored there. That is such a great story. And I saw that picture on Instagram and was totally blown away way by yeah. it. So well done, George. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I don't know. And like, for some reason, we always talk about this on this podcast. That story always comes up. You're the one who brought it up, not me. So, yeah. you, so you think about that for a second. I will. I wanted to hear the story behind that photo. It made an impression. <laughs> I had to hear it. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I guess I should ask you some personal finance questions because that's what this is all about. And I'll save the rest for dinner over there that we take you out to. But right, yeah. so I guess we did talk about regrets, but let's talk about wins. Like what is the best investment you've ever made to date? I have two answers for this. The first is Ethereum right? It opened the door to building some real wealth because I was able to reinvest the, the, the gains into other projects. And that got me thinking about 
acting as uh, an angel investor for the first time in my life. Getting into these other ICOs, it was sort of like a kid in a candy store wanting to invest in, because you only needed to invest like a thousand bucks, but that's not what being an angel investor typically would be, right? There's usually a minimum involved. No company wants to talk to you unless you, you're going to put in a significant check. And then who knows whether that company is going to take off. It, 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 it's a completely different world. So anyway, that's one of my happiest in, in investments. And another is probably my health. Investing in my health is probably the like single biggest return. Learning about my metabolism, uh, metabolism in general, learning about being on low carb diets, ketogenic diets, that allowed me the ability to wean off of uh, Adderall, which I was taking for ADD, and allowed me to have more energy, focus better. And that's a big thing. That's, a, that's obviously a big plus. Uh, you can't really do, you can't accomplish much with a sick body, unhealthy body. We all want a sick body. Oh, well done. You got me on that one. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with you. Once hitting a certain financial goal, I was talking to our last guest about what changed. It was like nothing, right? We still live in our one bedroom apartment and like, you know, sleep in our humble furniture, but suddenly like the grocery store is a whole new thing, just like getting really healthy. Mm. And that's yeah. like the one investment because you, that's like really the only way to buy more time on the earth is to like really take care of yourself. That reminds me of when I hit a million dollars in 2018, it was January, I felt when I looked at my spreadsheet, and this is all crypto, by the way, all right? I have like 99.999% of my wealth in, in, in crypto, which is why it fluctuates wildly and you need really thick uh, skin to, to, to be able to bear that. Yeah, it, briefly, I was a millionaire in, in, in January and the feeling of it, because I mean, man, I, for me, a relationship my entire life with, with, with money was, was love-hate. My dad had uh, instilled this thought in me that it, it takes a lot of work to make money. Well, it doesn't necessarily take that much work. It takes being smart about it and also having a, not a love-hate relationship with money. But anyway, I've been in debt, like I said, 350K uh, personally, right? Which is like soul crushing. Uh, and then to feel... Like I hit this seven figure number for the first time in my life. And it's, it's a number that is real was amazing to me. I, I went for a run once I, once I saw that. And I remember like singing as I was running and I had the most energy that I'd almost ever had. Uh, and I felt so good that this, this feeling of accomplishment on one of my profile pictures there's a picture of me holding a balloon. It's a whale balloon because that was the day that I became a whale. And that's actually something that Shoshana had given me to celebrate because she was there with me. It was, it was very soon after we started dating that this, that this occurred. And I felt so blessed to have Shoshana like celebrate that with me. And you can see in my face in that, that profile pic, like what that really meant to me. Like, this feeling of being on top of a mountain. It was short-lived, by the way, because Bitcoin went from like almost $20,000 to being like $3,000 in a, a number of years. So I remember telling my dad and my mom, calling them to give them the good news. And then a few weeks later, calling them to say, oh, by the way, I, I'm not really a millionaire any, anymore. I was, but it, not, not anymore. <laughs> But I'd, I'd already gone through all of these ups and downs with, with crypto. So it, it, it wasn't any skin off my back. That's my favorite thing about talking to you. And like one of the traits I admire about you so much and why I know you're going to be even more and more successful is your ability to like take these risks repeatedly and like have that tough skin. I think Bitcoin is a cruel mistress in that way. And like learning how to tame her is very few people can, but I think if anyone can, you can. Uh, but that is why we went the GameStop route is because other people have tread that path. There's like Warren Buffett and it's been around for 20 years, whereas Bitcoin is like far less predictable. I, I don't have a goal anymore. Now it's just a fun game. It feels like, because now I, I do feel independently wealthy where I could relax. I feel like I could retire. I, I don't want to though. I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and I'll enjoy it even more after this public sale. That's why I like 
what I leveraged in San Francisco was being close to companies and projects that were going to make it where, where all I needed to do was be surrounded by endless potential and make sure that I get in with the crowd who really wants to make a difference in this world and get rich doing it. And so that allowed me to put my little money that I had into some of these companies and have their wealth grow along with, with mine, it being, being invested in those companies, but only by being in San Francisco and hanging out with these like crypto people and startup community, would I ever have that exposure? Cause otherwise I'd be day trading and I wouldn't be doing a good job of it. I'm not that type of person. It's emotionally jarring. My uh, strategy changes midway and it has not turned out all that well. It's like just freaking hold it, just put it in my pocket and, and walk away and do something I really enjoy. I'm all about the index fund strategy personally and like for things that mm -hmm. I recommend, that's what I do. I'm a buy and hold kind of gal. What are all the things you need to stay in peak performance? Angel investing, what have you invested in and how do you recommend somebody go about it? How you get started is probably a function of what, what money you have available to you. So first, if you want to angel invest in crypto, move the hell out of the United States. And I don't mean in Puerto Rico. I mean, do not be a resident of the United States because there are a lot of deals that are happening, large fundraises, coin uh, sales, essentially, where United States investors are blocked from being able to get that. And the reason is that the SEC comes down hard considering that a sale of securities. So if it's not sold in the United States and a U.S. investor never gets a chance to hold any of those, any of those coins, it may not be considered a security by the, by the SEC and might be freely tradable on exchanges. But that means that as a U.S. resident, you actually have a second-rate passport for the first time ever, right? There are others ahead of you, right? There, when you look at these token sales, it would say, we cannot sell to citizens of Iran, North Korea, and the United States. And you're like, how the, what? How are we lumped in with those guys? <laughs> but yeah. That is so fascinating to me. Thank you for sharing that. How do you pick companies and how do you get on the ground floor? And like, how much do you have to put in? Like you can put a thousand dollars in and be an angel investor. You can through AngelList um, and you can by joining some people's uh, syndicates. AngelList is a really good way to do it. But the problem is in the United States, you have to be an accredited investor, which means that you actually already have to be wealthy or you know, have the cash flow to be considered wealthy. What, what is a, a the accreditation standard is, I think right now it's $200,000 a year in income or a million dollars in assets that doesn't include your primary home. And there are other things that make you an accredited investor, but there's like a, only a small percentage of Americans that can even fit that. And that really keeps the upper class upper and the lower class lower because that means that you don't get a chance to invest in risky deals. You don't even get an opportunity to be in a startup investing casino, right? But you can go to a frigging casino in Vegas and you can blow your entire paycheck and there's nobody stopping you if, you, if you're not. A, so yeah, don't, don't tell me that that is for consumer protection because it can't possibly be. How do you actually pick some of these angel companies to invest in? Like I said, surround myself with people who have access to these deals. And I'm lucky that they throw me a bone because I don't have the time to do the research myself. And they just say, hey, I'm putting together a syndicate. I'm investing in this company. Do you want to join my syndicate? The syndicate owner will take 20% carry, which is essentially a performance fee right? For, for it doing well, and maybe a one or 2% fee for putting together the actual uh, syndicate, because it costs money to run these things. So that's an easy way to get started, assuming that there really is a, a small minimum. There's also uh, Republic and the other crowdfunding platforms. So uh, for instance, Portal is launching our public sale on Republic because we want the crowd to be able to invest even small amounts. But you won't find that if you're dealing directly with founders and trying to you know, get a, an angel check in the hands of a company. Long story short, surround yourself with smart, capable people who want to change the world and want to also be wealthy while doing, the, while doing that. And you will, you can't help but fall into the good opportunities that they fall into. That's not that good investing advice. It's more maybe life advice. 
I don't know that I could ever tell anybody how to angel invest or even how to get started. I, I think I've been very, very lucky to, to do what I've been able to do. And it's just because of who I surround myself with. I think that's brilliant investing and life advice. So absolutely. And like on that note, I have to ask, what is like your net worth um, in that respect versus like your angel investing net worth versus your crypto net worth, et cetera? My angel investing net worth is very small, at least non-crypto angel investing. Most of my angel investing is still in crypto, right? So I want to be clear about that it fluctuates wildly. I would say maybe the most that I've ever calculated has in the, this year. Okay. So let, first of all, let me subtract what my company is worth because that can be considered my, my ownership in my company can also be considered part of my net worth. And it's actually how I was able to pass the accreditation rules of even having a million dollars in assets is by is by having a company that I owned 45% in and the company was was worth five million dollars just because we raised at a cap of five million. And so that was that's another way to to start angel investing is to actually build your own startup too. But that said, I would say it's been as high as this year, nine million, maybe 10, and as low as three, which is why it's like, it's, it's a wild fluctuation, maybe even as low as two. That's the crypto world for you. I hear you're truly wealthy when you don't actually know your net worth, which is why I was the same way. I'm like somewhere in between this range, but, and by two, you mean 2 million, right? Not like $2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. 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 How do you know when to sell or not sell? Like, do you just not sell and that's your role? You just never I sell. I, I don't know when to sell. Um, it's not been a strong point. I would often in the past sell very early. So that way I could get into the next ICO or invest in the, in the next coin. That was, I mean, that's, that's a nice strategy because it's, it certainly hit very well, but at the same time, it also killed me because I've certainly seen where if I just held on to the Ethereum or other crypto, it would have totally multiplied. Whereas the company that I spent it on uh, and traded to get into that deal went to zero. And that happens a lot. I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. I try to, actually my, my answer for that is get advice from other friends who love eating and breathing and sleeping with uh, these types of investments and get their advice. And it's probably going to be wrong, but don't be mad at them. At least you can stop wondering, hey, should I sell or should I hold? Do you, do you have any tips? Because I, I know a big core of your advice is to, to make those connections. So how do you build those connections with people um, and find them? Would you say, I mean, living in the same place mm -hmm. is a good start, but. You know, I liked building a meetup in San Francisco. It was, it was something that really called to me because I, was at the time getting into this like biohacking stuff and human performance, crypto was not doing well. It was a really bad bear market in, in uh, 2015. So I wanted to change things up and I wanted to kind of work in the human performance space in biohacking in like, like health tech. And that was a blessing because I saw some of my friends in crypto who ran their own meetups and then got jobs in, in the space. I'm like, oh, okay, if I want a job, I can run a meetup and kind of become like a domain expert by hosting other domain experts without actually knowing a damn thing about it. And so uh, that was my way to like hack into the system. Uh, and as a result, I was able to get a job in the space and also meet a bunch of people along the way and look at elite, look, look like a leader when I didn't have any business being a leader. So it was nice to you know, play that part. And somehow, because I was playing that part over time, maybe some people might actually consider me one. And I've, I've made a lot of friends. The other way I made those connections is by being very hungry with my startups to get investors and not being shy to ask for introductions to investors. And then asking those investors for other introductions to investors. I don't know whether it was the right strategy in actually getting investment in the company, 
but it sure as hell filled my Rolodex. Very clever. I actually like that approach because a lot of it's like pitching, but how do you even meet those people in the first place? So yeah, don't be afraid to pitch. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. I'm trying to, to create more messaging on this podcast. That's like for women too, because there's such mm-hmm. a disparate issue with women and getting investment. So I like that. Also peak performance. So for the audience at home that doesn't know George, you were the leader of a peak performance group in San Francisco, which was all about biohacking, like probably creating the optimal physical body and health. So if you want to talk about that a little bit and what like your favorite, if if you weren't running two startups right now, what would Mm -hmm. you be doing perfectly day to day to, to achieve optimal health? I wouldn't even be doing any of that biohacking stuff. That stuff really was helpful in getting to a certain point. And I know I can get back to it, but I have, like you were saying, what would I do if I wasn't running two startups? I would want to explore human consciousness, right? I don't know that going through like wearing a a wearable to figure out what my sleep patterns are like and re-optimizing that and, and optimizing my health and totally thinking about that from the standpoint of, of hitting goals is the most effective way to do it. I think really the most effective way to get the body you want is to somehow embody the body that you want. I I believe there's an aspect of consciousness that can get us there. I I don't know what that is, but it's something I'd I'd like to explore. Um, And it's not even for the purpose of having a good body. It's sort of for the purpose of, of wanting to explore the secrets that this universe has. And I wonder whether like, the, the the mystery schools of of you know ancient wisdom uh, you know kabbalistic people and early alchemists and people who study uh, noetic sciences these days have figured out a way to kind of manipulate our world consciously by by going inward and re- reminding remembering that that the same stuff that exists in our body, the chemical makeup that we have is so similar to the chemical makeup of everything around us that we, we convert our food into energy and we tap into the, the energies and presences of, of who knows what around us. I think there's an aspect there and I'd like to I'd like to play with it in the future. I love that so much. Lately, I've been really obsessed with the microbiome, which is something we're Mm. just like looking at what we know now and how little we know. I just have a feeling it's embarrassing. And in many hundreds of years, people are going to be like, they used to think calories in calories out was a thing or, you know, whatever microbiome stuff I've learned lately is that like our bacteria interacts with each other. So you're kind of like a bacteria cloud. One of the weirder facts I've learned is that like somebody with an obese microbiome and a skinny microbiome, if they get a fecal implant from each other will become skinny or, or obese. So that's, that's yeah, that's kind of like the magical stuff that, that you think about is there's just so many unseen things happening that we don't realize. And I, I love exploring it. It's fascinating, but that's how I got into the whole Dave Asprey it thing. It really is. I mean, that's the stuff that I would have thought about uh, in 2015, 2016. Of course, I think about that stuff now too, because that that's you know hard science that that is provable. My point is, what if we didn't even have to look at these numbers? What 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 if uh, you didn't have to optimize yourself because you simply dream about being fit, and your mind takes over, and and either it like manipulates the your your body in a way that's like magical, or it's not magical, and all it is is, is somehow you've you've made the decision that you are going to live in a healthy way, and you simply do so, and and so your subconscious knows how to direct your body to get the desired outcome that you believe you are becoming. I love that so much. I'm a big believer in manifestation. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I'd love to hear your thoughts on inflation because you've touched upon it a little bit. So do you have anything you want to share? I'm really concerned about it. Not, not personally. Uh, it's sort of like personally, I've because I've got a scarce asset that I'm holding like Bitcoin, provably scarce. It's like, yeah, bring on the inflation. Go ahead. Right. It's a daring the, the, the Fed to do so, but it's a hidden tax that every person who just simply has cash is, is paying without even knowing that they're paying it. And it gets worse every year. I do have a concern about what society will look like where we are paying this, this hidden tax and we, we didn't even choose it. And we don't have any control over it as, uh, as US citizens either. 
we can't vote anyone in to change the Fed policies. And we don't even know what their policies are. It's not auditable. It's behind private industries and behind closed doors. Ron Paul wanted to audit the Fed and was voted down. We can't even get a list of how, of how it works and why and what, you know, uh, they hold on the balance sheet. Agree. I, I think it's a big concern as well. Like I would ask how you would maybe think we should move forward. Obviously, probably stop printing money so much would be the main thing though. What do you think? My favorite way of moving forward is by opting out, voting with your feet. A lot of people have moved out of California who have the means to. Uh, many are very lucky to do so because they don't like what they've been seeing in terms of uh, governmental policies and the taxes that they pay did not equal to the quality of life that you you should have when you pay that amount of taxes. So people would opt out and maybe that will force new policies to come into play. Now, how do we opt out of the Fed is by opting out of the dollar. How we do that, maybe Bitcoin, but man, that's a really long game. And I don't know what sort of blood will be in the streets if people are successful. So fascinating. I'm so on board with you. We moved out of California ourselves and Oh my gosh, was it amazing between like taxes and quality of life. It was just, it was a big financial win for us to leave. But of course, like I also say that being lucky enough that we have salaries of California. So it's kind of like a mixed bag and it's, it's like sad that it's not what it used to be. It it really had a moment there um, that was really fun for technology and the party kind of is over, but we'll just move it to Puerto Rico instead. That would be nice. I mean, I I hear things like uh, people say the vibe here had is like Austin, Texas was 10 years ago, very, very early, but filled with these um, pioneers who want to see some change and blue sky available to make that change, right? Because you have a place that is economically decimated. Unfortunately, Puerto Rico is very poor. However, people love to drive around in uh, very fancy cars. I don't know how they reconcile it, but it's an interesting you know, need. The, the reason for the tax benefits here is because there's a, a real need by Puerto Rico for people to come in and create jobs, create wealth, and spend their money here. I know it's funny, the whole Austin thing, because a bunch of people are moving there is if it's like the next San Francisco, but I'm like, mm, Austin already happened, actually. I'm looking for like <laughs> the next Austin. But I mean, on that note, what do you think is the future of crypto and what coins are you putting your money on? I don't know what coins I'm going to put my money on. I look for early opportunities. I think I'm doing better at angel investing early on before a coin is trading than picking a, a coin that, that is uh, currently trading and watching it go up. Let me just say, what I, here's what I think. Bitcoin, I believe, is likely to double in price given not my prediction, but the predictions of all the people that I seem to surround myself with. And it's, it's not this echo chamber. These are, very, these are people who have made large bets before and been very right in in the way that they've called it. There may be an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF that is that that would be approved soon. And if one is approved, others can be approved as well. That's a really big win for investors, which then opens up institutional money, more institutional money than than is coming in today to flood into the market because now they can actually invest in the cryptocurrency itself rather than investing in companies that just so happen to hold it. That'll be a really big boon to the entire ecosystem. With Bitcoin going up, it means other altcoins go up because the money flows from those into other opportunities because you've got someone who holds a Bitcoin, sees that it goes up by 15%, but that another coin that typically trades in parity with Bitcoin is only up 10%. So then, oh, hey, there's an additional 5% to be made. Let me let me take some of that and, and put it in here. And you kind of see that type of trickle effect occur. So long as you're not in really awful coin territory, you might not go wrong by investing in the top 10 coins and just holding on to them. But my biggest bet is Bitcoin. I'm trying to stack as much as I can currently because I do think the price is, is going to double. And I think it'll happen before the end of the year. I love that. Yep. I would say if I was going to ask anybody, it would be you because you've really, you've been in it for a while now. So you've seen a lot of highs and lows. I like the idea of an ETF. Does anything like that exist? Seems like it should already. 
No, it, well, it's a regulated product that no one has been able to get approval for yet. People have tried and no one's gotten that approval. There's some speculation that there will be approval coming this year. I love that. I'm, I'm definitely like an ETF and index funds kind of gal. So what is a widely accepted belief or advice that you strongly disagree with and why? Money doesn't grow on trees. I completely disagree with that, right? The feeling that that it takes hard work to generate wealth. I don't agree with that either. I, I think there's an energetic component to money that can be tapped into it in understanding that it can be created out of nothing. That's very strange to say, but I have seen these entire market caps of, of new coins being invented and out of nowhere, if this, this money just piles up. Uh, and, and by the way, economists will gasp at what the hell I'm saying because it, it does not really fit an economics viewpoint. You know, it, the wealth can be, can, can be generated out of thin air. Really what I'm saying is that it is easy for the money to flow from one market into, an, in, into another. And you can be in that rising tide so long as you surround yourself by those who are, who are building it. And so long as what they're building really resonates with the dream that you have to, to see a, a future that's bright. So I know I went a little woo there. I love it. I think it's great. I'll end with like one last thing, which was the addition to what I said about, you know, hard work and building wealth. My team is going to kill me for this. The less hustle that I do, the wealthier I feel, the more I feel like I'm accomplishing because I'm able to just sit back and, and, and not be so hungry for it. And it's that hunger that acknowledges that you don't have it. I like to take a really slow and methodical approach to uh, building, building wealth and not be too worried about it. It's that worry that certainly kind of drives, drives bad decision-making. And somehow the belief that I probably will be wealthy has somehow manifested itself. George, I think you said some of the wisest and most interesting words I've ever heard on this podcast. So I'm I love that. Everyone. <laughs> it's true. Very philosophical, very interesting, very quotable. What advice would you give to somebody looking to start, grow and sell their own business from scratch today? Depends on the type of business that they want. They have to know right up front, are you looking for a lifestyle company? Are you looking for a four-hour work week company? Or are you looking to do a startup? And if you're looking to do a startup, it ain't the four-hour work week and it's not, a, it, it, it's not a mom and pop thing. It is not a side hustle. It is you're living and breathing that company and, and you can't help but surround most of your life with what you do for that startup. It, it becomes you essentially. It can be draining, uh, but it can be ultra fulfilling. So what the, the suggestion I have is if, if someone has an inkling to do it, so there's never been a better time to build a, a startup because as a, as a founder, let's say you're a solo founder or, or a non-technical team, you have less of a disadvantage uh, than a technical team because there's so many do-it-yourself tools that are available, solo founder tools that, that are now being created. So you can rapidly test what your market thesis is and fix it, create a new website to change it, create, change the offer, and that will help you reach product market fit. So first decide what you really want out of this startup and the time you want to put into it. And, and do you think that it's going to be venture backable? That'll help you decide whether it's a startup or whether it's a, whether it's a lifestyle business. And then don't delay doing it. Someone else will just come up with that idea. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution is really what matters. So there, so if it's that good of a, an idea, there are 10 other people somehow thinking about it in their brain. And a few of them are probably executing on it right now. And you don't even know but maybe they don't have the chops to, to, to do it. Maybe they don't have the staying power or the dream. And if you have the dream, just go for it. Cause 
the only thing that you can do is fail up. Yes, you can lose a lot of money doing this, all right, because you're probably going to quit your day job and you, you'll have to in order to try to make it work. But you'll fail up because who doesn't want to work with a person who has built a startup or built their own company and been responsible for soup to nuts, the things that you create as a, as a founder, right? That's a, that's a really desirable quality. So even if all you're looking for is just a new job, building a startup can be the way to that. Now, how to sell it? I don't know that I've been that successful. I, the companies that I've exited were really small market cap companies. I didn't really make much money off of those. I don't have the advice for that. I'm waiting for uh, my big sell-off day, but I don't even want to because I'm really enjoying what I'm what I'm doing with Portal. I want to shamelessly plug you. So where can people find you if they want okay. to reach out? On Twitter, Geo Burke, G-E-O-B-U-R-K-E, but I'm not even all that active on it. More more like my my companies, uh, portaldefi.com, D-E-F-I, right? Short for decentralized finance. So portaldefi.com, you can register for the whitelist if you think that that what we're building is something that you'd want to put your money behind because you believe that that's part of what the, where the future is going. And founderpool.co, which is where four founders can share equity in one another's startups. And that's for another time. Amazing. For part two in Puerto Rico. Yeah. I mean, soon. Absolutely. <laughs> having, I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next month. George, thank you so much for coming on the show. It truly was a pleasure having you. And I just really couldn't stop talking. It was so much fun. There's just endless things that I could pick George's brain on. He's obviously extremely brilliant. I'm so honored that we go back as far as we do. And I love continuously learning from him as a friend and connection. So what were your favorite parts of the episode? What did you think of what we discussed? Let me know in the comments below or remember to leave a review. As always, Always, thank you so much for tuning in. You're the most important part of the show and I want to bring you the best guests possible. And in order to do that, I need lots of reviews and lots of likes because high profile guests like to be on shows that have listeners. So thank you so much for liking and hitting subscribe so that I can get guests for you. And as always, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Next week, we're going to have an incredible guest. You're really going to love it. So be sure to tune in. And as always, thank you for watching Invested Success. Invested Success.